Hi, I'm Nick Vogelzang. I'm medical oncologist in Las Vegas, Nevada. Hi, I'm Dan Petrolak, medical oncologist, Yale University, New Haven, Connecticut. We're here today to talk about the changing landscape of uh, castrate resistant and hormone sensitive metastatic prostate cancer. Dan and I have both had the opportunity to be in this business for full 30 or 40 years, and we've seen a lot of changes. The changes we're seeing are continuous, and I'd like to spend a little time going over some of those changing landscape issues that Dan and I both have enjoyed uh, watching and sometimes leading. So Dan, what do you see as the biggest change in the last, say, five years or so? I, I think the biggest change is the earlier use of agents that we had traditionally used in castrate-resistant prostate cancer, moving these agents up to the hormone-sensitive state. And we've seen a tremendous increase in the overall survival of pit men with, cast, with overall metastatic prostate cancer uh, by the earlier use of these agents. What do, you, what do you think about the use of Dostaxel earlier? Is it catching on or is it not catching on? I think it's had a, a wave. It's had two different waves of, of, uh, of popularity, so to speak. First, when it was first introduced by Chris Sweeney in the Charity trial, we saw about an 18-month improvement in median survival for those patients who had high-risk disease. And six cycles of docetaxel without prednisone, and you were basically finished with your treatment. Then with the introduction of abiraterone and prednisone in the same space, also now with enzalutamide, uh, as well as apalutamide, now we have other competing drugs, each of which have their own advantages and disadvantages, we're seeing less of a use of docetaxel in this particular space. I heard uh, an interesting statistic the other day that only about 5% of patients in the United States are getting docetaxel in the hormone-sensitive state. Uh, do you have an, uh, uh, sort of a theory or a hypothesis as to why that is? Well, I think there's several reasons. There's always this stigmata that goes on with chemotherapy that it's, it's toxic and um, you have to go, go to the doctor's office to get an infusion as opposed to getting an oral pill with abiraterone or enzalutamide or apalutamide. So there is, there is this um, a patina that goes around that particular yeah, thought. Yeah. Well, I know I'm personally uh, still using a lot of docetaxel. And uh, I find that if you uh, approach the patient right when they're diagnosed, uh, they're not so uh, negative uh, about it because, you know, they're frightened. But also, more importantly, you say, look, then I've got all these androgen receptor inhibitors that I can use after the dose taxol. How do you use it in your practice? So I, I have a discussion about the short-term and the long-term side effects of these particular agents. Particularly with docetaxel, we know that you can get some neuropathy and neutropenia, but when you do the six cycles of treatment, you're done. Yep. It's over with, you don't have to worry about taking a pill. We know that abiraterone and prednisone does have some cardiovascular effects. In fact, uh, from uh, Jefferson University last year, there was a report that there was a high rate of cardiovascular events in patients with pre-existing cardiovascular events. So a patient who has cardiac dysfunction, I'm going to lean away from giving abiraterone and prednisone and perhaps docetaxel, apalutamide, or, right. or enzalutamide. So have you, have you used a lot of the enzalutamide up front in the hormone-sensitive space? I've used it to some degree. Mm. Not, not, not a lot, but to some degree. Yeah, and I, you know, I've shied away from it because of the, uh, the, the CNS toxicities. And I've been a little reluctant to push real hard, particularly since these guys often are older. I, I agree with that. And I think that one of the drawbacks to these agents, and I think that we have underappreciated this, are the long-term... Uh, effects on muscle mass, mm. on mental function. I'm seeing patients having more and more fatigue on a chronic basis as they're getting out to two years on abiraterone. So, so this, I think, is something we have to be very careful of. Remember, in the castrate resistant state, we're generally giving these drugs for a shorter course of time. Right. Over a longer course of time, you may see other side effects that may impact significantly on quality of life. So in this changing landscape, where do you uh, think the PARP uh, inhibitors will go uh, in the earlier hormone-sensitive phase? Well, I mean, I think it's certainly uh, 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 something we need to do on a trial basis. We don't have any evidence at this point of, of using PARPs in uh, the BRCA positives in hormone-sensitive disease. Again, we've got to think about the long-term side effects, in, including the effect on the bone marrow, because anemia right. and thrombocytopenia are significant uh, side effects with the PARP inhibitors. 
But I think at the same time, we have active agents. Perhaps we need to give these in short courses like docetaxel. There are trials that are, are being designed to look at that particular question. Good. Yeah, I, I think they're going to be potentially useful in that space, but I'm not sure yet. They're fairly uh, difficult on the bone marrow. Exactly. So exactly. I'm not sure where we're going to go with that.